Karen gives me this little cue. I think based on this and that, we should go ahead and get started, which is also sort of in the nature of informally where we'd be in the back of the room and then I'd make my way up to stand in front one way or the other and say something. So that, that I will do since we're amongst um, friends of long standing. So as everyone who is, is and has been coming in from all the places you're, you are, um, welcome. Um, thank you for joining us. This, Evening, we are delighted, which is still afternoon in, where, in terms of where Gretel Ehrlich is, but um, this evening that features um, Gretel Ehrlich for um, this extraordinary newly published book of hers, um, Unsolaced, Along the Way to All That Is, that's um, just come out from our friends at Pantheon Books. And um, I'll say some other thing else about continuities, but um, Gretel's had the same editor and the same agent all these years and uh, someone I know so that's that's part of part of one of many things and although there's a, this evening uh, well I think address kinds of change also going on for for all the constancies but I also want to say something right at the outset that um, because this book you know a lot of ways is is a is a circling back to the first book she was um, more widely known for which was the 1985 book the solace of open spaces uh, for which um, Gretel at the time in Wyoming uh, was the, the first author to actually travel anything more than say from Portland um, or, or at least um, from any great distance um, where we, we were just beginning to figure out people, you have an author, people come, this great conversation and all happens and, and it just lives on. And, and certainly the, the, how the books live on in, in part of that. Um, and it was some, some months after the book had come out, but everyone knew the voice and, and the things that she was saying in that book had um, enduring um, um, value or, you know, that you knew these, this was a book that was gonna be around. And um, we've been lucky in the ensuing 35 years uh, that uh, Gretel has come many other times to Seattle and has indeed um, um, written a, a amazing series of books. None that until this solace that circles back quite like this, although although um, a match to the heart and islands. Well, that was especially a, a match to the heart was was sort of a, a, a return to what, certainly the Wyoming landscape. But she has been over the years um, writing about different places and. Um, these in many ways are visited in the new book. Um, these include um, certainly at the heart, um, the Arctic North, um, Greenland, some of the other islands up in the very far North and which she's written of in various ways um, in, in books like especially This Cold Heaven. Um, and um, uh, she's also, but in this book, she also visits, she returns to Wyoming, she's in California, she's in Kosovo, she's in Zimbabwe. And um, there are often cases return visits, and there are also um, uh, you know new visitings, new new um, friend, new friends made, and there's also the question of what else, what's, what else is going on in the world, and I, I, I don't want to get in the way of what you'll hear between Gretel and Francis McHugh, whom we're also delighted to be um, having as part of this. Um, Francis is also here in Seattle, and. Gretel, I didn't, I guess I did say she's in Hawaii. So that that was not, she's never done a reading for Elliott Bay from Hawaii before, um, but this time has many firsts. Um, Frances are, um, is a professor at the University of Washington. In fact, she's an award-winning teacher there. She re recently received the Distinguished Teaching Award um, that is given to people who are, are doing the great work she as she's done it, which we also saw in her role many years as the director of uh, Hugo House here in Seattle. And Frances herself is the author of three collections of poetry, if I've got that right, of all of which she's read with for us, so starting with the Stenographer's Breakfast, and uh, most recently, uh, Timber Curtain, um, which um, is, was published by Seattle's Chin Music Press. She's also written a um, marvelous book uh, that centers on Montana, uh, The Car That Brought You Here Still Runs, and she wrote the text to a beautiful monograph of Mary Randlett's work. And I think she has a, another book coming out soon. Um, is that still coming, Francis? The book or your your prose poem blurbs? Uh, you're muted. But I have it right here under my desk at my okay. knees. So okay. you guys can just like hit okay. me up in the chat and I'll send okay. it to you. I, I almost read the book book hole is the name. I almost read the book's hole. Yeah. 
Um, so anyway, you'll, we'll wait to see when that comes out um, and do something with Francis for that. So tonight um, it'll be Rettel and Francis talking. Um, I, don't, I don't know where you two first met, maybe that'll come up, but, um, um, and then Francis, in the course of which Gretel will read a little bit, and uh, and then Francis will at a point bring your questions in, which we encourage people to put in the chat. Um, and um, I will um, disappear. Uh, I'll reappear at the end. But uh, my colleague Karen, who's really making this happen, uh, is the, and besides putting greetings to you in the chat walls, and and we'll be mentioning the books, and those are both. Um, Gretel's new book is at LA Bay and available you, as we we're talking, uh, you can come in and get it. You can also order it online or um, by um, calling us up. All those things can happen. And I hope it's not too long before we see Gretel back here in Seattle in, because that's the part we're missing is having this all an, an, an in-person occasion. And she just said she does fly through here. So we will um, work on that happening um, in one way because it's, it's so good to see her again. So, um, to know you are all out there um, because uh, we can imagine the warmth and, and intensity of, of what it would be like if um, we all were in the same room. So we'll give that same energy as we can from our various laptops or desktops or phones and give it now to um, the wonderful duo that this will be and is um, Gretel Ehrlich and Francis McHugh. Oh, Rick, super. Thank you so much. And Gretel, what a thrill to have you. I'm going to imagine you being here in Seattle. Um, and coming back for this book in particular uh, is a return, a full circle from the solace of open spaces. The last time we were together was in 2003 during the James Welch legacy event at Hugo House and my daughter was clamoring into the green room to see the woman who had been hit by lightning. Um, and now she's 20. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, I wanted to open by asking you, what's it like to move in a loop like this, to go back to your early book, which was started in this incredible space of grief and also an open expanse of, of Wyoming. What was it like for you to go back and return to that to do this new book? Well, I mean, that, that book, uh, Solace, um, was a kind of uh, a book of rev my, my personal revelations of, of going to, a, of being in a new place and, and, and finding that I actually couldn't leave. I kept trying to drive away and and, and I'd turn around and Daniel and drive back to wherever I was. And, um, and so it became a kind of celebration of the people, the landscape, the animals. Um, and so, so much has happened since then in the world. And um, what can I say? You know, you know, I found that I had become unsolaced not that I don't find great joy in those all those same places. And Wyoming is indeed my heart's home. I'm often not there, but when I am, it's 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 um, a, sort of an indefinable pleasure to be there, deep pleasure. And um, and I've backpacked through all the mountains, the wind rivers. I've cowboyed all over the place. And I've really um, felt it through the soles of my boots. And um, so to go back to those early ranches where I lived and the, and the woman, Mike, who was my mentor, taught me how to rope and taught me to cowboy. I'd grown up with horses, but I, I didn't know how to really do ranch work. And, um, and her, she's gone now, but her kids are still close friends. And so in a way it was, you know, just like this, being on with Rick and, and you, who, who we've all known each other so long. And, it, you know, it's it's happy and sad at the same time. And then, you know, the world changed, especially in terms of the climate disaster that is ensuing. And so I had to look at all those same places with new eyes. Well, it's incredibly beautiful, your writing. And as you said in Unsolaced, it's a blend of reportage and poetic observation and deep reflection. And 
that seems to carry on from the solace of open spaces. Um, can I ask you to start maybe by reading a little section? I, I want to share with everyone just sure. the beauty of that combination of poetry and reportage and matter of factness that permeates your writing. And the page I'm thinking of is on, on page 14. And I think maybe starting with early on, right through the end of the page would be great. Okay. Early on, I saw how conventional society wanted one thing only, reduced to a splinter in a reductive world. But I went the other way and kept unpeeling my mind. Sagebrush and string quartets, Buddhist practice and cowboying were all of a piece. Quantum decoherence interested me more than mapping out a firm life plan. The ground would always be spacious landscapes and animals. The sky would hold the soul songs of Brahms and birds. The blue shawl of imagination would enfold everything else. When David, my partner, lover, and co-filmmaker died of cancer, when we were both 29, all that we had before us, not only a new life together, but also generous filmmaking and writing grants disappeared. Stay in Wyoming wasn't a matter of hiding. I was living my grief to the hilt while working outside with animals and with people to whom I didn't need to explain. The book I began writing then wasn't about personal loss, but about what I had found, what and who saw me through and who saw through me. One doesn't get over a death. It stays with you forever. At the same time, it sharpens desire. Like a wolf eyeing a herd of antelope, I made passionate forays into the cowboy life with a nothing to lose attitude. My friends in New York and LA asked when I was gonna stop hiding, but I was living best I could and didn't wanna go back. One survives or not. It didn't seem there was a choice. Should I continue on or is that enough? That is beautiful. And then in the very next um, paragraph, you say, where does solace reside when you've lost it all? And the idea of solace, I think, becomes much more layered and complicated because of your through line of climate change in unsolaced. How do you think back on your early ways of using the term solace in the solace of open spaces? And how have you come to think about solace or unsolaced now? Boy, that was, that's a hard question. Okay, I'll ask you an easier well, one. You know, I mean, first of all, <laughs> no, that's okay. Mm -hmm. First of all, I was young. And, um, and so, you know, you have the, the world that keeps unfolding in, in front of you and you just, you, you have a kind of expansionist idea about what's possible and, and what, what could happen. I mean, I'm not a very um, aggressive or organized person in terms of how I plan out my life. I just kind of take it as it comes. Mm -hmm. um, and, but um, yeah, so, you know, it didn't have that tinge of so much of the tinge of the Japanese word aware, which means both uh, beauty with or beauty with sadness, a tinge of sadness. Now, I would say sadness and beauty that um, there's a, a um, we're just losing the world as we know it very abruptly. And what's really sad, oh, we're having an earthquake. Oh, well, it'll stop. <laughs> Wait, we really? do live near a volcano. <laughs> <Really>? Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. God, this is just being recorded. Watch the bookshelves, Gretel. <laughs> yeah, I know. I never put a put books behind my bed wherever I live. <laughs> okay. Anyway, um, <laughs> um, so, um, unsolaced, yeah. So, you know, you're just, you're sad about all the losses, you know, the extinctions and the losses, and yet, and let, yet beauty and, and, and 
laughter and jokes and animals and uh, stuff. It keeps happening. You know, life keeps happening. It, it, it is very boisterous. And, and so you just think, uh, you, you just, you're sort of bouncing all at once. You're totally aware, at least I have been, um, of happening to the ice, what's happening to degraded land, um, you know, all the horrible things that are happening, all the animals and birds and insects we're losing. And at the same time, it's still robust. So it's, it's, it's a different kind of solace. It, it comes in a kind of smaller chunks. It's not, you know, when you're young, it is expansive. And, and as it's not only just because I'm old, but also because the world is changing in a, in a really um, rapid, abrupt way. So there is a, just, um, you just bite on the, the things. Yeah, I love that. And I think you describe in Unsolaced um, as one method of getting through, you know, grief or um, the global grief that climate change is bringing. And also, you know, personal grief is the widow woman's way, which is kind of this self-reliant, intuitive path through the world. And um, I wondered if you wanted to talk at all about the overlap of of grief space and then the wide open spaces that you inhabit and write about? Like, do they have an overlap for you? Because grief seems so confining and and then your sense of yeah. space is so generous and big. Well, I guess maybe it, um, and it doesn't feel so confined. I mean, I don't, you know, uh, I'm finding that hard to answer. Just, um, I guess I just use the the outside, uh, the the landscape, the horizon line, the sky at night. I, I always build a platform bed um, with windows on three sides around me so that I can see the night sky at all times when I can't sleep. Oh, In fact, sometimes I get so excited about the stars, I, I can't sleep because of that. Oh, um, that's beautiful. So I just, you know, I just kind of send it out. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I don't particularly um, experience it as, as confining, but uh, I mean, grief is confining, but I just, I just, I just go out. I just go to the mountains and climb until I get blisters. I, you know, cowboy, I, I'm, I just send it away, not away. I send, I send myself out with it. Oh, so nice. that maybe it needs more ground on which to set, you know, because it never goes away. It just, it just softens like an old mountain range. Mm -hmm. That's a beautiful way of saying it. And I think all, uh, if you all haven't read this book yet, I mean, you're really gonna enjoy it. And I think one of the characters who exemplifies that is Mike. Could you tell us about her? Right. Mike is a woman. She, she came from a family that believed in naming their children after really good cowboys, whether they were male or female. So she got, she was named after a cowboy named Mike, but she was very feminine and beautiful, and uh, but just a hell of a hand. She quit college, and she but grown up in KC, Wyoming, and went to her family, or it wasn't their ranch, but her family. Her father was the foreman of a huge ranch, huge, huge ranch, and and she said, you know, Dad, I've quit college, and and he said, well, you know, I don't approve of that, and he, and he said, and then he. There was a silence, and then he said, "Well, you better make a damn good hand of yourself." <clears throat> so she did. She she's now in the Cowboy Hall of Fame in Wyoming, and um, she just I don't know why she just took me on as her um, student, so to speak. Um, she was in her late fifties. I was in my mid thirties, and I'd ridden all my life, ridden horses all my life, but 
you know, she just, the day I moved to this little cow town, she called up, we had, I knew her nephews and they had told her I was coming and she, she called and said, I hear you want to be a cowboy. Uh, I'll pick you up at 5.30 and don't, you, you know, I'll bring you a decent horse to ride. <laughs> so that that's how it began. But, you know, she was so quiet. She was quiet with the animals. She was so quiet in the way that she taught me, she just would ride alongside me and quietly say, well, you know, you better, you better stay back here a little bit because he'll spook the cows or something. And, and, but really, you know, what I learned from her was how teamwork worked. Um, it was, a, it was really as much anticipation of what the animals were going to do, what the weather was going to do, what, what, what we needed to accomplish that day with the animals and to anticipate what was going to go wrong before it did go wrong and to be in the right place at the right time. That's, that's a cowboy's best foot forward. You know, you need to be there just as things fall apart. And, and that gets noticed by, by the ranchers if you're there instead of just sort of galloping over like, oh, I didn't know that was gonna happen. So, and we, so we spent years cowboying together. Then we started getting um, hired on big ranches in, in Montana and other places. That, and we, we were sort of hired on as a team. And it was, it was wonderful. We rode colts together. She was just always side by side. And, it, and then when I, I ran, ran my own ranch by myself in the summer. And so her deal was that I had to, when I rode out by myself, I'd leave a note. This was believe me, before cell phones and internet, and I barely had a telephone, leave, leave, a, leave a note which horse I was riding and where I was going and when I thought I would come back. And so she said, and then I had to call in when I returned. And if I didn't call in, she would come up and they would go looking for me. But that was the kind of friend she was. It was thoroughgoing and yet very quiet. You would just never know anything was happening. It, it was the perfect friendship. Oh, you know, I love what you just said. Um, you need to be there just when things fall apart. That's like <laughs> yeah. such a great life lesson from her. And I found a sweet little spot to ask you to read about Solace and Mike and being there when things fall apart. And it's on the top of page 33, just uh, one paragraph. Solace comes in unexpected ways. The limitations of ranch life, what Mike had called the dawn to dark, can't see to can't see predicaments of daily life, became a kind of liberation. What I had asked for as a child, a ranch and a life of writing, I now had. The mountains rose up straight out of the back pasture, its cirque folded around me. With a good library and bountiful animals, I found my aversion to home making a sharp turn. Staying in one place and going deep broke through my restlessness and enlarged all that I saw. I looked around and what was around looked at me. That's so beautiful. What I love the way that you animate the landscape in that sentence, what was around looked at me. And it makes me think of how few people can write about the natural world in a way that isn't domesticating it or trapping it or making it into their kitchen. Or do you know what I mean? Like the impulse for many writers is That's to connect easy. what's wild to what's domestic. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any advice to offer other writers about writing about the outdoors and nature and the wilds in that way? Well, it was, it's um, it's sort of what Malcolm Marvel in, in Berkeley said about hanging out with with native people. You just have to do a lot of hanging out, like day and night, day and night, day and night, year after year after year. And also, yeah, I mean, you just have to live it. I mean, you can visit it and you can write it about it from that point of view, but you have to be careful that you tell your readers that it's from that point of view, but 
on the other hand, you can live it without any, um, you know, uh, I just lived out, out, oh, I mean, the ranch that we had in Shell, Wyoming, and the Bighorns was, was not even, you couldn't even get there in the winter. And um, our only, actually, our only winter visitor was Barry Lopez, strange enough, long before either of us had written about the Arctic or anything else. And he was a, a, a friend of my ex-husband's and, and, and it was winter and we had to get him, go and get him at the bottom of the road with our team and wagon because it was just moguls of snow. And um, anyway, he, we went and got him and he came and stayed a few days. And, but- um, Rattle, come on, Barry Lopez, that's amazing. Who else made yeah. their way with ice picks and shovels to you when you lived out there? <laughs> well, Jim Harrison arrived, but not, but in the summer he was wearing a white linen suit. I said, Jim, you're gonna get dirty. He said, I am I'm already dirty. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> okay, do continue. Please go on. And then what happened? Anyway. No. Um anyway, no, but about about living out. You, you know, you just have to really live the life. You can't just, I mean, if you want to write about it in a, in a real way. And I know, um, I think Jonathan White might be listening in. He's a sailor who lives on Orcas Island. And, and you know, he's a real say. He, he, he has lived amazing, uh, in an amazingly intimate way on the oceans. I, and I have sailed with him as well. And, you know, it just takes a complete um, commitment, like a vow of poverty. It is like a monk's vow to me. I lived in kind of semi-poverty the entire time. You know, we, we put up our own food. We, we uh, I lived, later I lived in a one room log cabin that was off the grid and I, I shoveled snow to melt for washing up water and I had, you know, I just, I just lived. Right, well, can I and be then, honest about this? Like, um, it, it seems like in these books, um, you end up doing a lot of the shoveling and riding and herding and Mike too. And the men are all kind of like, whew, you want to talk about that? <laughs> No, okay. no, but they're not. No, okay. I know just that's. Like I you're left doing a lot of the the work in different situations when the grunt work when the husband is off yeah. having a meeting in Georgia or whatever. I mean, I don't know. Oh, that was yeah. Well, no, I don't want to talk about that. Okay, we don't um, have. <laughs> Alrighty, moving on. But, but let me I see. mean, so uh, yeah, I mean that um, he was he was gone. He did something different in the summer, so I actually took care of the ranch myself from, well, it depended on the weather, June or July, um, it, all the way into October, the end of October or something. So I was there a lot, but I, I don't recommend ranching alone. It's, it's, it's hard, but, uh, it's good. but. Okay, I have to tell you. Just like, be, um, yeah. Okay, here's a little fan note. I'm gonna insert a fan note here. So there's one thing about like writing poetically about wild open spaces. And then there's another thing about delivering the truth and delivering it straight. Like, let me read to you this tiny paragraph from the solace of open spaces. Okay, you're in your early 30s when you write this. Listen to this. I was there for public broadcasting to film four old sheep herders on the Bighorn Mountains from June through September. I had come alone because my partner in the project, also the man I loved, had just been told he was dying. He was not quite 30. I mean, you know, I'm, I, I find that incredibly moving because the juxtaposition between your incredible clarity with sentences and here's who I am and here's why I'm here rubs up against these beautiful descriptions of place. So I just, I want to insert that fan note and say how effective that is to me as a reader. So mm. there's that. Also, if I might just read another little piece from The Solace of Open Spaces, and I want to see your reaction to it and how you think it connects to the new book, Unsolace. 
The truest art I would strive for in any work would be to give the page the same qualities as earth. Weather would land on it harshly. Light would elucidate the most difficult truths. Wind would sweep away obtuse padding. Finally, the lessons of impermanence taught me this. Loss constitutes an odd kind of fullness. Despair empties out into an unquenchable appetite for life. The narrative that follows has an overlapping chronology. It is riprap and does, I hope, form a hard roadbed. But as with all major detours, all lessons of impermanence, what might have been a straight shot is full of bumps and bends. You were mighty young, my friend, when you wrote that. How does that you <laughs> well, I'd heard, I'd, I had, I had, um, had had some hard lessons. You know, the love of my life had died. And um, also I had pneumonia when I wrote that. I, I, I remember I was, um, I had the bed pulled where our ranch was heated only with wood stoves. There was a wood stove in every room and um, anyway. Yeah. Do you think it's like, do you think of your narrative now in this new book as riprap and coming from a hard road bit and then taking necessary turns? Or were you just like through line climate change, go? No, 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 no. It's like riprap. I mean, I, I don't, I'm, I never know, you know, like my going to Kosovo. I, I met, I met that doctor in the Seattle airport. We had both flown in from Alaska on different planes and we're going out on different planes, but we were both terribly hungover and and lost in the Seattle, you know, where are the sea gates? <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and, and you know, and then we talked and then he said, you, you, you need to come to Kosovo. So I did. I mean, I wasn't exactly planning that. I didn't really know exactly where it was until yeah. I met him. I mean, I, of course, I mean, I knew where it was, but you know, I hadn't looked at the map in, intimately and really yeah. thought about it and then read all the books about the war, et cetera. So yeah, it's always, um, you know, the path um, appears before you as you're walking it. I mean, mm -hmm. that's it. No matter what, you can try as hard as you can to map it out, but it, it ain't gonna happen. And um, so you just have to, you just have to go with it. Yeah. And, and it, it takes way too energy, much energy to try to straighten it out. I, I'm, I'm too lazy to do that. Well, I think most people are constantly trying to straighten, straighten it out, right? Yeah, I'm not that. Yeah. Um, so guess That's what, Colonel George Devoki is on, on this. And I Hi, want George. to just say that George Devoki is an incredible climate science scientist who studies, I believe, cormorants at the Arctic Circle. And I first met yeah, him. Black guillemots. Black guillemots. Black guillemots. Oh, Black guillemots. So sorry. Yeah. Oh, bad. That's so bad. I mixed those up. Anyway. He's an ornithologist. He's. <laughs> yeah. And he, um told me that his plane tickets up to the Arctic Circle to check on the birds kept getting earlier and earlier. And it was like this real life evidence of climate change. And I think climate change is often abstracted from us as being some concept outside of our personal experience. And George, I think, points to real palpable evidence that he had in front of him. And Gretel, I know that in this book, you're working to make that palpable evidence for your readers. Do you want to talk about the overlap of your work and George's and what you see in that connection? Yeah. Well, I mean, I'll just start out by talking about going to Cooper Island, which is um, 25 miles east southeast of Ukiavik, which is the former Barrow, Alaska. So it's it's at the top of Alaska. It's just a little slab, uh, slab of sand, basically. You, you, it's bare, you can barely see it as you're approaching it. 
And he's been out there for 45, 46 years, something like that, um, keeping a data set of the, um, the lives and, and births and fledgings of black guillemots. And you, you know, people would say, you know, so what? Who care? I don't care about it. But what it what it became, I mean, is not only an amazing study of, of a single species of seabird in itself, but it became an index to um, an, an unrivaled index to abrupt climate change. Because when he first started going there, the sea ice, which it, so it edges, of course, to the north is the Arctic Sea. The Arctic Ocean, and when he was first went there, the the sea ice was right at the lip of the island in June, and now there it, it is at least two hundred miles away, and thought to be next summer not there at all. So you have to. It represents everything about the abrupt demise of ice and snow and ice cover in the whole world. Albedo needs to be on everybody's, um, in everybody's kitchen notes. It should be up on the wall. Albedo from the Latin alba, meaning white, is white surfaces that reflect solar heat back into space, which keeps our world temperate and livable. And as those, as ice and snow cover disappear, the world gets hotter. That's why it's getting hotter. So it's really important. And on top of that, you're, you, he has witnessed the extinction of a, of a seabird, just as Alan Savory in Africa, who I spent a lot of time with, um, has witnessed in his 85 years in Africa, the extinctions of animals that used to be in massive, massive herds of hundreds of thousands of animals are now two or three or four animals wander by. So, you know, there's all kinds of things. And, and it's important to remind people that we're on that extinction cliff as well. Um, so it's, it's good to pay attention. And the, and, the, and the other root cause of climate change is degraded land which is land that has been abused, overgrazed, plowed, um, paved, whatever. A land that, that has not been aerated by, by grazing animals or just um, um, so that rainwater and snow cannot permeate the land. So it causes drought and flooding. So, I mean, it's a, you know, it's complicated, but it's simple. So you have those two things and they work together. It gets hotter and then you have less water and you have less rain and then you have the, but on the other hand, the, uh, the um, water vapor is the most um, prolific greenhouse gas right now, which is why they just had 15 inches of snow in New York City. Um, so you, you just have a lot of, you have violent storms, you have extinctions, you have all kinds of things going on. And, you know, by the time, by two, the year 2000 in Greenland, it, it was already called a rotten ice regime there. So it's now 2021 and really almost nothing has been done. And people are still saying, we don't really know what this is or how it affects us or. Yeah but you will when you run out of food. Yeah, Gretel, um, as a little antidote to our pausing over something that big, um, George Tavoki has agreed to offer a few clarifying statements, right, on our okay. show. Yeah. I feel like we have a show now, Gretel. We have a show. Yeah, we have a show. George, would you- Come on, like... bring it on, George. Yeah, bring it on, George. Turn on your camera, say howdy. What are you doing? Oh, man. Are you going to turn on your camera? <laughs> uh, I'm trying to turn the camera on. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, well, yes. maybe it's enough because, uh, you know, you don't want to see me with my, I, I haven't had, I haven't really had a haircut since Gretel saw me last on Cooper Island. Um, me neither. So that's true. <laughs> I, I, have, I have had a haircut since I saw you last. I'm <laughs> sitting on my hair, George. 
it's it's very good to see you. Um, no, I'm I'm enjoying this very much, and 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 the fact that um, the whole issue of climate grief, the whole issue of basically being a idiosyncratic biologist who stayed out in the field too long, who stayed out there for 46 years, and then realized, wait a minute, I'm seeing something that I shouldn't be seeing and that no one else should be seeing, but uh, but people need to know about it. So um, yeah, it, it's been. Um, it's been a long, a long uh, trip, and it is, um, uh, it's something that's going to keep going. It's going to, I mean, I'm basically, uh, it, I mean, I'm afraid, I always was talking about the fact that things were going to be changing in the next century. Now it looks, and then, and then it was by 2050. Now it's in the next two or three years. Right. Mm. Wow. Well, George, I'm um, really glad to hear from you. And are you still going up and checking on the birds? Um, yes, yes, I am. Whenever people ask that, I always think of somebody going up to somebody on their wedding anniversary, their 50th wedding anniversary, say, do you two plan to stay married for the next <laughs> year? <laughs> you know, I mean, and I think- That's like, why George won't get married. <laughs> <laughs> So, you well, know, George, that's a whole separate like webinar that we got to have, but maybe not today. But anyway, yes. And and, you know, and, you know, and I mean, and when people say, you know, why have you done this for 50 years? I've said, um, um, you know, uh, well, er everybody has to be someplace. So I've been on Cooper Island for the past for the past. Year. <laughs> um, right. And, and the thing is, I mean, I, I really didn't know, I mean, what is strange is that people uh, give me credit for being dedicated and to get back to the 50th anniversary thing, you never go up to a couple on their 50th anniversary and say, you two must really be dedicated because I am, I, I greatly enjoy, Gretel knows this very well, I greatly enjoy going to the Arctic. Uh, I, I like waking up and not knowing whether a polar bear is going to be outside the cabin or not. Um, uh, it's a very... We like the polar bears. Yeah, it's been a very exciting thing to do. But again, it is also very, I, I didn't know after having done it for like 40 some years that I would then be on a death watch uh, to say, how long can right. this commonly persist? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, see, that's what I mean by unsolaced. It's the death watch. It's climate grief. It's ranch grief. It's animal grief. It's human grief. Yeah. It's like it's, it's like the world should have non-scenic overlooks. You know <laughs> what I mean? Like we've been enjoying all our scenic overlooks and now it's like we need climate reminders in our face. Anyway. Yeah. Um George, thank you so much and we're much looking forward to your appearance at Town Hall. Um and that's happening on February 11th, everybody. So you can see George there. And thank you so much for chiming in here. Okay, well, thank you very much for thank bringing you, me in. And thank you, Gretel, for coming out to Cooper Island. <laughs> right on. Oh, I wouldn't have missed it. It was yeah. fantastic. So Gretel, I think George's comments provide a little segue for me that I wanted to ask you, you have this beautiful, really simple sentence in Unsolaced. And it's climate is culture. And I, I hung on that sentence for a long time in its sort of clear eyed confrontation of what's happening. And also the layers in the book that talk so much about culture. Um, Dennis, who's part of the Greenland exhibition is writing symphonies. Um, the guy in Kosovo is a poet. What do you think the layers of culture are that keep appearing to you as you do this work, um, educating yourself about climate change? Well, um, you know what, I, I mean, I guess the best example is, is my many years um, in Greenland. Um, so I became, I, I started traveling with an extended family group who live in a you know a sort of good sized village, Kanak, and then other people in Siopraluk. These are the two northernmost villages, inhabited villages in the world. Um, 
So I actually witness the death of their culture because of climate change, because everything they do depend eating, traveling, um, uh, providing clothes for themselves depends on sea ice. And the sea ice on the west side of Greenland has been um, disappearing rapidly. Um, and in fact, it's maybe some, you know, really depends a few months of the year, there might be some ice. In the old days, yes, in the old days, it came in in September, mid-September, and it went out, it melted in the beginning or mid-June. And it used to be 10 feet thick on average. I've been there in 2007, it was, I mean, 2004, it was seven inches thick. It was so thin that it, it moved like rubber under your feet. And then, and then it started breaking away. We spent a month just looking for ice good enough to get home on with our dog sleds. So, so that's what I mean climate is culture because yes, we, we live in climates. We, this is, we grow food, we live, we, we have water, we have animals, we have each other, we have each culture is, arises from the ground. The, the life ways of every culture, the language, the, the songs, the, the story, the ancestor stories, as they call them in Greenland, the, everything arises from the particular landscape in which we live. And when, once that landscape, uh, as at Cooper Island, starts changing uh, ab abruptly, the culture shatters. And um, it's, it's um, shocking. Yeah, I think um, also when I read that, I thought about your love of ice. I mean, you have this incredible relationship to frozen places. So many of your books are, are centered on that. And it's like, a, maybe it's a metaphor for you. I don't want to project, Gretel. I don't want to project. But, um, but it also is very much a climate interaction that you have with what is being lost. It's not well, just like... I mean, I first learned about... Uh, learned about climate change. I mean, I kind of, you know, I'd read some things in the 70s and stuff, but um, um, what was in 1997 when the, the dog sled, the dogs that we, these are big freight sleds, 14 feet long, pulled by 15 to 20 dogs in a fan shaped hitch. And they all just disappeared into a hole in the ice and we just barely made it out. Um, and the uh, later the, the, um, you know, I only travel with these, you know, hunters, and they later said, you know, in Greenlandic, none of them speak English, that there's something wrong, this shouldn't happen, please find out what's, what's going wrong. And that launched me onto, um, onto educating myself, and I called friends at the University of Alaska, and this and that, and, and tried to figure out what the Arctic oscillation was and what, you know, everything. And Jason Box, the climatologist, the glaciologist and climatologist really informed me about the accelerated uh, ice loss on the Greenland ice sheet. And he still is, um, you can, you can listen to him, his thoughts on that online. And um, yeah, so I just, it, it plus I, th you know, the Arctic is just, spectacularly beautiful and I've never been cold there I guess well you know we wear polar bear pants and fox fur anoraks and stuff you know we dress properly but um just feel really happy there really really happy mm -hmm. that for me was the emotional crescendo of the book that image of the sled and the dogs and then the man saying to you, this isn't right, please help. That was the whole kind of narrative center of the book reaching this incredibly powerful moment. I, I found it very moving. Um, I have a page 199 where I was gonna ask you to read a little bit about exactly what we're talking about. Um, and it, 
begins, there's a paragraph on page 199 that begins some days. And I was going to ask you to read those two paragraphs. And the, and the next one? Yes, yeah. please. Okay. Some days the moraine and its ice carf, carved, sorry, ice carved ponds seem to sweep all the way into the cabin as if on an incoming tide so that outside, inside, began to feel the same. This, I have to say to the, um, this is in Wyoming at my one room cabin that was on a glacial moraine. Across the meadow, the land bent up into high parks of forested slopes where elk grazed in morning sun. Here, I could imagine a wall of ice sliding by and feel its cool wind. Moving glaciers made this place, square top mountains and thousand acre meadows, hanging valleys and waterfalls. Ice was the clock that signified time with no before or beyond, only the grinding, melting, firing present. Ice was time's ephemeral source and demise. So often we miss the whole fabric aspect of where we live and our own consciousness embedded within it. We are not interrelated, but intra-branched. One branch wound around another and fused into a single embrace. Our lace-like nervations have overlapping frequencies. It's what the Greenland what the Greenlanders call sila, consciousness, weather, and the power of nature as one. If nothing else, we are what the physicist Richard Feynman called scattering amplitudes, holes with unbounded totalities. Oh, so beautiful. Thank you for reading that. I think of the prose as these holes within unbounded totalities too, because just to wind us back to the beginning of our chat, you know, the idea of like reportage and poetic observation and deep reflection and the juxtaposition of good, authentic, plain speech next to descriptions of land are really beautiful. So thank you for reading that. But, I, you know, I just want to say that <laughs> None of that is ever premeditated in my life. I mean, what I did with my life, because I didn't go to graduate school, et cetera, et cetera, and I dropped out of college uh, several, you know, three or four times. Um, you know, I read voraciously all my life, which is why I love Elliott Bay Bookstore so much. And, and bookstores like it, there aren't so many anymore. But, um, you know, I just poured it in. I read poetry from from the very beginning and, uh, and poetry in translation. And I read science and, and, and I read the entire, I read fiction, everything that's the body of all the great writers works, not just one of Faulkner or whoever, but all of it and all of the European and the Japanese writers and, and the South American writers. And I read and read and read, not, not, not for any purpose, but because I loved it. Those were, you know, it, 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 the, it was the same listening to string quartets. It, it, it sang to me, you know, I needed, it was, you know, it was nourishment. And so I think that's, those were my teachers. And I, I don't ever, when I write, I ha never have any idea really what I'm doing or even, I just have no idea. It just, it comes out and then of course I, you know, I cut away, cut away, cut away and um, five or six or seven um, drafts of everything. But well, it's it, it's important to know that this isn't some formula I've figured out. Oh, that it could be so easy. No, no, um, I'm, I'm just being an observant reader and I, I see how it works and would never, slam a graduate school scaffolding on it. I think of it more as like that <laughs> you seem to think of like um, you're writing more like a poet would. You know, it's associative, yeah. but it's also straight up plain, authentic speech. 
Do you think writing your prose is like writing poetry for you? Are there overlaps? <laughs> you know, to me, it's the same. Uh -huh. I don't, um, often when I'm writing prose, uh, on, I always keep a stack of blank paper on, on my right and, and a poem will just kind of swing out. I mean, these are not great poems, but uh, <laughs> by any means, but uh, you know, I, I, oh yeah, that I remember. I was telling my husband what um, it's like. We have a bunch of tangerines right now. They they grow well in the winter in Hawaii, and it's the difference between the pros is more like picking a tangerine and just squeezing it into a glass with your hand, and poetry is like putting it into the the grinder and grinding the the um, the juice the 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 covering of the tangerine, everything, the stem, whatever, and just pushing it through. And that's, you know, a, a poem is a kind of pressed down substance. And um, mm -hmm. so I guess, I, but I don't, I, um, I don't really, I don't know. Uh, okay, now listen, my friend, I have some questions coming in here on the chat from the audience. So okay. they're going to feel like kind of random and like one after the other. So get ready. Okay. Okay. So um, Taylor would like to know a little bit more about your research process. That's his question. Or their okay. question. Well, I'm um, in the old days. Um, you had I had to, I had to fly to Berkeley or to UCLA to use their great libraries or UCSB, you know, um, I had to go somewhere where there was a, an expensive library to, to, to read anything really. I mean, I have a huge library of my own, which I pack around with me, you know, I think between Neil and I, we have seven or eight, probably 8,000 volumes. So it, it's burdensome, but necessary. So I always have kind of, you know, a lot of what I need, but then of, of course you, you move into other things. So, so I go to libraries. I, I, um, but this was before the internet or the Google search and you couldn't get, you know, now you can get academic papers on my science things and you can get all sorts of things and listen to people talk. And, you know, that's been a huge boon. Um, so there's, I mean, at that level of research of just finding out what factual stuff and also doing, I do enormous background reading for, um, you know, I maybe read 10 books for every sentence I write about so or a paragraph, yeah. you know, I, I do, I read backwards and, um, so it's just there, whether it's used or not. And. And then the other thing, the other kind of research is just to be there and to put yourself in the place as deeply as possible, as is appropriate. Um, the, the wonderful Hawaiian teacher here on the Big Island Pua, um, Kanahele, says, you know, the first thing you have to do is you have to surrender you have to surrender to the situation, to the landscape, and to to create room for a, a true association with that place and that time and and whatever the people or whatever is around it. You have to you have to give yourself to it. You have to step back. So so oh, um, nice. and then I was reminded too in Greenland that tradition is when you go to somebody else's camp like. Um, Jens and his family, we used to hunt along with some friends of his from another village and we'd all go to this island. But if they were there first, the, the tradition is that you stop your sled out on the ice and you wait for them to come to the edge of the ice and say, please come, even though they had just been on the phone the day before, you know. Um, so it's that kind of taking a minute and stepping back and Seen was there. Well, it, it and, so like, that kind of research. Yeah, yeah, I think you're saying like to follow your hunches, take a step back and look at the whole piece and do the work. 
Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and in, in, yeah, embellish that with all the reading you can do. You know, I, I took the three, over the years, 3,000 pages of Knut Rasmussen's ethnographic notes on Arctic culture from Greenland all the way to Point Hope, Alaska with me. And I read every single page. I mean, it had to do with Arctic culture that stretches across the polar north. And um, yeah, I couldn't have, couldn't have been there without having done that, without having some sense of who they were and how they had lived and what they, how much they had lost and how much they still had, what life ways they still had. And, but you know what, more than that, it was, was really inside them what made them tick. Oh, that's, that's super. That's a great response. Um, one of our attendees, Sally, would like to know, was there anything in your childhood that led you to wanting to live a particular life or not live a particular life? <laughs> yes, everything in my childhood. Hey, my parents took us, well, we had animal, we raised horses, or my father, we, you know, we had horses, that was his love in life, but he, of course, did other things. Um, so we had animals that was good we went camping because we were too poor to do anything else and that was just to me that was nirvana and um and it was the old days where parents really didn't supervise you very carefully and and um it was a less populated perhaps safer world and my mother would just say go outside and come back at dinner time and and sometimes I wandered and sometimes I rode my horse around and, um, you know, so I was just outside, which is where I wanted to be. Not, I mean, not all kids are like that. It just suited me. So that's what I, I loved. What I hated was boarding school, being any, any kind of confinement. And so I, in, in one, you know, kind of glib sense, I see how I've lived my life is, is my rage against restraint. Um, you know, the, the, they always sing, don't fence me in at all the cowboys funerals. I figure, yeah, I want them to sing that song of mine too. <laughs> oh, boy, I'd hate to ever need to make a case to lock a child up, but you know, okay. All right, now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we have an anonymous attendee who would like to know how you perceive um, nature writing will change as the natural world undergoes collapse and crisis. Like, what do you think of as kind of the horizon or the future for writing about the natural world? Yeah, well, I think, you know, we, uh, we have to all tell it like it is. We have to see it. All you know, whatever is collapsing, collapsing. We have to see, just as I described before, those bursts of of beautiful, lively, robust stuff. Um, we have to see that in the midst of of collapse. But I, I don't think, you know, in a way, we're 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 all throws going out there and opening the, you know, building a shack and then opening the door and going out of the shack and seeing what's there. So you're just seeing what's there. So in a, in a sense, it won't change at all. It will be, um, you know, Thoreau climbed Katahdin and had a, a sort of an amazing experience there. And, and, and we will, the mountains are still there. We'll, the, we still have that opportunity if we have it at all if we're not starving to death, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but those of us still with the privilege of being able to write and to read, um, just, we'll just tell it like it is. I'm just so worried, Gretel, that it'll be like, you know, like my grandchildren will be out, like looking at a weed growing through the cracks of a, of a long gone target going, look, nature, you know? On target. Yes, I, I visit. I went back to Japan a few years ago, and, and my friends and I went to the outskirts of Fukushima, the you know, where that everyone knows where that is, to these abandoned towns. And uh, so, so this tells the story. And, 
you know, we got out and we looked at things and, um, and there, were, there were big signs, neon signs that told you how much radiation you were being exposed to, which actually wasn't very much at that point. And um, so we're driving around and, you know, you know, places that sold cars and grocery stores, all the windows were broken and, and it was strange. And then we were driving on the way back to the highway and we passed a farm field that had not been planted or anything. And there were two wild pigs, or I mean, I guess they were feral pigs playing in that field. So sort of like two young animals playing and we and the 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 guy who was driving slammed on the brakes and we all just sat there and watched them transfix this moment of of innocent joy you know in a little field in the midst of you know utter destruction so that you know there it is yeah that's it so that's your it. grandchildren will see that too Whatever. yeah it's right. like it's not all going to be like Fukushima. <laughs> it'll just be different than yeah. what we've grown up with that's a good point so unsolaced comes back in a loop and connects with the solace of open spaces is there a post unsolaced for you post so what do you mean by that you mean am i writing oh, like, yet, uh, i kind of i um, a little re bit re solaced yeah, resolaced. I love it. I'm a little bit sad to think of like un I loved both books, right? And so they form this like closed feedback loop, as they would say in the <laughs> gaming world. Um and I'm thinking yeah, right. like all the like what are the future books for you that you're gonna make out of this both despair and incredible curiosity about people and culture and the climate. Yeah, well, though, you know, the one really a somewhat exciting thing that's happening is what is going to be called regenerative agriculture. But the part that excites me is restoring um, large scale grasslands all over the world, because it turns out that grasslands sequester as much or more carbon than forests, which get, especially these days, burn down all the time. Um, and whereas grass uh, stores carbon in the not only in their roots but in the soil, so you can it can burn over, but the carbon will still be there. So the, you know, I have this great vision of of buying up or uh, somebody buying up all the corn farms in the Midwest and restoring the entire Midwest to shorten long grass prairies. I mean, that's it you know, sort of pipe dream, but, but this is the kind of thing that can be done and it doesn't have to be just large scale, but every, anywhere that's possible to, um, to restore grass, um, grazing animals, to break through the broken food supply system here to, you know, relocalize food so that there is, you say you have students with food insecurity. That that's absurd. That is absurd in this country at this point. And um, you know, there's just a whole lot that can be done in a different um, relationship to working um, cooperatively in terms of land to take the the idea of land ownership away. I'm also working with some. Um, pastoralists in Spain who are trying to redo the, the traditional um, um, pathways for sheep and goats and horses that actually went all the way from Sevilla, Spain to Finland in the old days. So, so instead of private ownership of property, you, I mean, yes, you can have some what you need, but then you open up different pathways. And then in the same way that migrating animals create uh, a better um, grassland by going through and manuring it and aerating it and moving on, the same thing can happen with domestic animals. So, um, and at the same time, revive the culture of uh, those, those pastoralists. Oh, uh, so, you know, great stuff answer. like that is exciting to me. Yeah, I'm looking mm -hmm. forward to that book. And um, I'm going to close. No. <laughs> Whatever it is. Get to work, Gretel. I'm waiting. OK, um, I have one last question. And then we're going to wrap it up. 
because you know everyone's attention span on zoom is like but you're doing great I you're know. They're, they're already sleeping uh no they're not okay <laughs> Someone is asking if your former ranch in the Bighorns is still there and if you ever go back. Well, of course it's still there, but I'm not there. Uh, no, I don't. I go to the area, but I don't go back to the ranch. Yeah. It's, it's sort of an end of the road ranch. So either you're, you, you're invited to go or you, well, you know. Okay. Yeah, it's still um, there. Gretel, we're going to close this whole conversation with that sentence you just said, which is that it's the end of the road ranch, my friend. So that's going to okay. bring us to closure right here. Do you like that? It's the end of the road ranch, everybody. Yeah. Thank you for joining us. And Gretel, what a pleasure to get to have a conversation with you. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Francis. Great to see you again. And Ricky you too. And Bookstore is such a Treasure. sanctuary of sanity I'm, in this I'm troubled world. I even take last words after what Francis and, and you got to have done, but just as I, I get to thank both of you for um, giving everyone this, as, as many people have been writing in the chat, these last comments have all been thank you, thank you, thank you, and, and much love and um, goodwill is in there to both of you and um, Gretel. Um, do take care. Good. Come, come see us um, when you get on this side of the water again. And um, and everyone who hasn't I will. read this, read it. It's um, I, I, it is a form of solace to read it uh, uh, for all the or the re solacing or, guess, or something. As Francis was doing, it's a it's a beautiful book for this time and for a long time to come. So um, thank you all again. Thank well. you, Rick and thank you. Um, Gretel. It was much. a, a pleasure to reconnect and i'm i'm so sorry for the grief space and difficulty you're in right now and i just want to reach out and tell you that so thank you for doing this okay and it made me really happy we'll to see you tomorrow. all soon yeah okay i'll see you soon okay thank you both <laughs> bye <laughs>